Uh, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today we have a very special session uh, with our guest speaker, Najma Osidhu. Uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's Najma Osidhu. Yeah. Uh, so she's a postdoctoral research associate at University of Cambridge and she has done great work in automatic fact checking, hate speech and multilingual uh, large language models. And today she will be talking about uh, what is needed, what is what is, what is built in natural language processing, toxic language detection, automatic fact checking model that you cases. So without wasting any time, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just try to share my screen. Let me know if it's okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, yes, we can see it. Okay, then I'll be so I won't be able to see the comments because I'll be uh, sharing my slides. But uh, yeah, just stop me if you think that uh, I've done something wrong. OK, uh, so I'll be starting. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. And I'm very happy to be here and to be presenting uh, some of my work. And uh, I'll be talking about what's needed versus what's built in NLP. And I'll be specifically given toxic language detection and automated fact checking as use cases. I'm in my last days as a postdoc at the University of Cambridge, uh, and I'm very happy to be talking about uh, kind of a wrap up of my work uh, here and also my PhD work at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So basically my research interests in general, I'm interested in multilingual toxic content detection in an LN in NLP, automated fact checking, and also NLP uh, for low resource languages. Now, just to give you an idea about why I kind of framed this talk this way. So uh, with my uh, colleagues, Mikhail and Andreas, we uh, looked into the narratives of automated fact checking papers, highly cited ones, and we found uh, that many narratives are vague. Uh, in the sense that there are some elements that are missing about how this technology that you're building in automated fact checking is going to reach the goal that you're trying to reach. So, for example, fighting misinformation or helping journalists or and so on and so forth. Now, the findings are generalizable to work on toxic uh, content detection in NLP, and that's why uh, I I'm going to focus on um, what's built uh, versus what's needed. And uh, I will be talking first about why we generally work on, on hate speech detection and automated fact checking in general. So uh, usually the incentives fall into two main categories. The first one, you can call it scientific curiosity. These are challenging research problems in NLP, computational linguistics, linguistics. These are also interesting instances to test your machine learning model or business on, for example. Or you would like to have real world impact. So you would like to help with content moderation. You would like to help with media consumption and so on and so forth. You would like to assist journalists, moderators, etc., etc. So I'll be focusing on the second type of incentives on the ones uh, that fall into the axis of uh, the axis of real world impact so uh, in this case your motivation can be for example limiting misinformation limiting hate online mitigating bias in uh, large language models, for example, which are, the which are at the core of NLP systems, you want to make knowledge bases more factual, etc. But if you would like to have an impact, then you need to study the problem in its right context. And by that, I mean you need to articulate the goals of your system and you need for that empirical backing. And you need to study the feasibility of uh, the problem that you're um, uh, focusing on and also its solution. Now, think about it this way. For each model that you're building, you need to think about it as a non-detached uh, model. Basically, it's based on data that was generated by people and you're building a model to help people, for example. And you have a goal in mind. So basically, uh, 
this NLP system that you're building um, has a goal, for example, of limiting misinformation or limiting toxicity online. Uh, and for this, you're trying to help users. These users can be moderators, can be journalists, etc. So the means of your model, the model that you're building, need to be aligned with what they think uh, will help them. So uh, if we would like to have an impact, then we need to hear of, from these experts, from the users that we're trying uh, to assist. And we need to articulate the goals of our systems or the ends of our system. And you need also to explain to them or to explain to anybody who's going to use your system how we go, you're going to reach these goals. So first, I'll be talking about my work on toxic content detection. And second, I'll be talking about my work on automated fact checking. So uh, the first part is when I was not very much aware of what was needed. And the second part is work that is be better aligned with what's needed. Now, don't get me wrong. When I say I was not very much aware of what's needed, doesn't mean that any research that you do when you were not very much aware of what's needed is not useful at all it is but uh, you may need to actually improve on it and so on and so forth so i'll be checking if uh, you have any question for now or i can just go on all right then i'll continue so uh, I'll start with my work on toxic content detection in NLP as a use case. So disclaimer, I do not aim to build systems for automated content removal. And uh, you may know why, you may guess why, uh, or you may basically uh, learn why I don't do that uh, later during this presentation. My own personal goal is to improve uh, hateful content detection for both detection and mitigation. I've also been working about probing toxic content in large pre-trained language models, but I won't be talking about this specific work. And I also worked on evaluation uh, of, uh, of bias in, in different uh, hate speech and abusive language data sets. So I'd like in the long term uh, help bit, build assistive technologies for moderators and experts. And I'm also involved in projects um, on data collection for documentation, especially in low resource languages, specifically African languages and uh, my mother tongue, which is Algerian Arabic. So also content warning, I'll be sharing some upsetting content and examples, and I apologize for that. So uh, first of all, why we even uh, think about working on this kind of problems because basically uh, the words that we share on social media or back in the days for example when it, when we didn't have social media it was actually the media it was for example the radio in the case of rwanda back in 1994 uh, this kind of um, toxic content can have real world impact now the real world impact doesn't happen doesn't happen uh like in 24 hours uh, but if 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 it's uh, consistent uh, then it may have actual disastrous um, disastrous consequences so uh, to give you also an idea uh, in in the first two months of the pandemics uh, on a study that was on carried on 193,000 covid-19 related tweets there was a rise of three a 300 uh, a 300 rise in hashtags on twitter that encouraged or incited anti-asian violence also children and young people people under uh, 25 victims of cyberbullying are shown to be uh, more than twice likely to self-harm uh, there was also a study carried out by Amnesty International and Element AI that showed that women politicians and journalists were assaulted every 30 seconds on Twitter. And last but, but not least, the Rohingya genocide in Myanmar was incited with Facebook posts. So this was consistent Facebook posts shared, etc. And uh, one of the reasons why moderators did not uh, act in a timely manner is due to the fact that the moderators did not speak the language. So this is a huge problem because if your moderators do not speak the language, they either uh, do not 
they, they either don't moderate at all or uh, they delete or remove or automatically remove or non-automatically remove actually uh, posts based on reports which can be unfair or just based on keywords uh, and this is a problem and i'll be expanding on that so more recently actually uh, there was uh, one of the biggest meetings uh, of uh, content mod moderators in kenya who asked for uh, better working conditions and better practices they worked for facebook youtube chat gpt and TikTok, and uh, i think that this is a good incentive to actually uh, look for what they need uh, in terms of assistive technologies, for example, and we could build things that may help them, that, that, that may help, uh, that may make their lives easier. So, how can people get targeted online? So, either entire groups of people can be dehumanized on social media or individuals can be threatened. And the online policy against hate speech is usually based on four main axes. The first one is the common discriminative attribute based on which a post uh, discriminate against an individual or a group of people. It can be ethnicity, religion, gender, you name it. Uh, the presence of slurs. And this is a problematic one because some of the most uh, hateful and toxic and dangerous posts do not contain slurs. And also slurs can be part of friendly conversations between people. They can also be part of posts that are shared by, say, for example, teenagers that are trying to be edgy. They are not necessarily hateful. So there's also uh, the third axis, which is the intention of the post. And that's also a complicated one because this is very hard to detect and also it's very subjective. And uh, the fourth one is that uh, actually humor has a specific status. So, for example, if you have a cartoon, that makes fun of uh, victims of a genocide or uh, victims of an earthquake, then because of the free speech laws, it doesn't fall under the category of hate speech, while it can be much more hateful than any uh, blatant uh, toxic post. So uh, this is, these are the main axes based on which uh, the, the, the hate speech policy is designed. Now, what are the odds of finding posts online like we are on social media and what are the, the odds of finding like blatantly hateful posts saying like people from certain region, for example, uh, need not to be seen on, in public or something like that? Well, very low. It means that to the question is the are these policies enough, then the answer is probably not. So uh, how do current toxicity filters work? So if we automate this, for example, if we fully automate this, and then how, how, how do our classifiers work? I would have loved to actually change this slide. I've been presenting it for, for a few times now, for, for a couple of years, maybe, maybe even more. I would have loved to actually change it, but actually still the current, current toxicity filters even with all the technology that we have are still working this way in a sense that they spot words uh, based on character and token based features and then they judge a post uh, based on this word so if it contains uh, the n-word while like the this uh, tweet may be part of a friendly conversation of of or not a non so hateful conversation then it may get uh, spotted as hateful while, while it's not so they suffer from bias due to this lack of context and they do not detect toxic language in a nuanced fashion and last but not least mm, the majority of the filters focus on english and it's a uh, worldwide problem so this is also problematic because sometimes we do overgeneralize from the English classifiers to other languages, which is problem, which you, you will also see during this presentation. It's like a big issue. So uh, when I started working, I had these expectations that we could reach a unified representation that takes nuances into account. So I wouldn't call something like hateful or non-hateful, and I'd be calling it, uh, I don't know, like hateful, uh, disrespectful, uh, offensive, and so on and so forth, uh, so that we don't uh, over uh, generalize in terms of hate speech. 
And uh, I thought also that I could use transfer and multitask learning to improve the detection. So I, together with my uh, lab mates, I built a data set uh, for three different languages. And I was uh, thinking about the fact that there are no clean, clear indicators of hate speech. So for example, for slurs, then uh, you, if, if you have a slur in your uh, tweet or post or whatever, um, it may not be, it may not indicate hate speech. So for example, in the third tweet here, uh, it's using a slur, but it's telling a story. It's not in anyone. And there's also no unanimous definition of hate speech. Uh, and also like, as you can see here as well, in the second tweet, on the other hand, it's using a slur, but it's offensive towards uh, people from Guatemala. Now, uh, you also have different targets and you have also different degrees of identity uh, of intensity. So, for example, in the second tweet, it's direct uh, offense. It's a direct offense towards people from Guatemala, where in the first tweet, it's showing fair against immigrants coming to America and uh, bringing diseases. So it's not like blatant hate but it's kind of what you could call, for example, fair speech. And there's been actually recent work, really uh, interesting work by uh, other people on fair speech. Uh, why also should we uh, build data sets for languages other than English? Uh, not only because we need to, but also we need to actually acknowledge the fact that the topic covered in hate speech data set varies from language to another. So for example, in these two uh, tweets, in two Arabic tweets, then in the first tweet, uh, for example, there's a slur against people from the Arabian Peninsula that does not have a direct um, equivalent in English. While in the second tweet, it's also talking about the issue of immigration, but, it, but in a different way. You, This is a nationalist tweet and yet, uh, if you have a hateful or offensive tweet towards immigrants or refugees in English, for example, or in French, then maybe uh, what you would find would be um, actually uh, uh, direct hate while here you're having like a nationalist tweet. So the same topics are spoken about differently. And you have also different targets. Like uh, you may not think about certain people as main uh, targets in other languages. So what's hate speech? If you look at any dictionary, then you may find a different, even at uh, like even at the slight, even even a slight difference. But like uh, about what constitutes hate speech, which is why actually, even if you look at the United, uh, at how the United Nations defines it, then um, it, you you may find uh, a different definition. Uh, which is why actually in the literature uh, you may you can also find and you will find different definitions. So for example, in this uh, one of the first uh, data sets, if not the first big data set in NLP to, uh, that was built for hate speech, uh, they tried to actually collect data uh, based on slurs. While uh, in this also uh, very, uh, very commonly used data set by David Son et al., they avoided collecting data con co containing slurs because um, they found out that uh, these, uh, these, these tweets that contained slurs were actual, actually tweets by teenagers uh, playing video games. So uh, in my previous work, I chose the, the term hate speech to refer to any toxic language with, with respect to different nuances uh, because of the non-existence of a unified definition. That's why you may find me talking about toxic content right now rather than hate speech, because I, would, I prefer talking about uh, all the uh, different forms of toxicity rather than only hate speech. So uh, the data set that uh, we built uh, in our EMNLP 2019 paper uh, was annotated with respect to uh, different aspects of hate speech in order to cover the subjectivity and the complexity of this task uh, and to slightly counter the lack of context. Although you may not be able to counter it like 100%, but a little bit, 
uh, with this um, nuanced annotation. And we covered different languages in order to later look at the cultural differences and also to introduce data sets uh, for languages other than English. Actually, English and French, uh, sorry, uh, French and Arabic, because I speak them, so I'm uh, able to um, look at the data and do some error analysis. So uh, th we built this data set uh, based on different uh, collection rounds where we revise search words. We can, we can talk about that later if you're interested in, in the data set building. Uh, but we revised the search keyword, the search keywords uh, based on uh, some controversial topics that we observed, for example, and uh, some of uh, some of the keywords that were observed later in the different collection rounds and so on and so forth. In our pre-processing and guidelines, we anonymized the tweets and we explained the meaning of slang words to the annotators and provided them with detailed guidelines and they could reach out to us. Now, we used Amazon Mechanical Turk for that. I do not really recommend that. And I'll be talking about this, uh, this specific uh, point later. Uh, I would prefer uh, either another platform or if you know the annotators, that would be even better. So during the annotation process, uh, we had five annotators per tweet. And in our final data set, we had five annotated aspects and more than 5,000 English tweets, more than 4,000 French tweets and more than 3,000 English tweets, uh, Arabic tweets, sorry. So our annotations indicate uh, the tweet's directness. So whether the text of the tweet is direct or indirect, uh, the hostility type or the toxicity type, uh, it's actually a multi-label data set. So if two annotators agreed on a, to, on a label, we kept it. Uh, it indicates the degree of toxicity uh, of the tweet. So it can be, for example, offensive, disrespectful, hateful, fearful out of ignorance, abusive or normal. The target attribute or the attribute based on which the tweet uh, discriminates against an individual or a group of people, the annotator sentiment or how uh, people, how the annotators felt about uh, the tweet. It's also a multi-labeled uh, criterion. So if two people, if two annotators agreed on a label, we kept it. And uh, this was based on a scale of negative to neutral sentiment. So it could be shock, fear, disgust, anger, sadness, or indifference. And we had also uh, annotated targeted groups, uh, 16 major groups. Now, this is also uh, not 100% recommended. We, we kind of normalized the groups uh, based on the observations that we made, like the common groups in the three languages. I would say that it's good to actually keep track of all the groups, even if they do not exist in other um, languages. So, uh, for instance, uh, this tweet was annotated as indirect, as offensive. Most of the annotators felt that it was uh, thought that it was offensive. Uh, two of the annotators uh, felt angry when they read it. Two others felt disgusted, and it discriminates people based on their uh, based on disability. disability. So uh, this is another uh, example in French. This is actually indirect hate. It shows fear against uh, people uh, from Africa. Uh, and actually, the annotators, uh, most of the annotators, felt indifferent when they read it. So uh, we were interested in how uh, the different annotated aspect could help uh, one another during classification. So we considered each of the annotated aspect as a classification task. So we ended up with five tasks per data set and three data sets. So one per language, one uh, English, French, and one Arabic data set. And we tested multitask learning on the different data sets and tasks. Back then, we used Sluis Network because it was uh, told to us that it was uh, at least like claimed in the paper that it was adapted to loosely related tasks. I mean, you can use any other uh, paradigm right now, but I think that uh, there are still problems in this uh, with this task. We used Babylon cross-lingual embeddings back then uh, with dimension 200 and one hidden layer only because of the shortness of the tweets. 
and uh, we compared results uh, by looking at how each uh, data set and each task performed on its own, how different tasks within one data set performed, and how uh, many each task with respect to all the data set performed, and also uh, in in all uh, the the different uh, 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 when when you consider each task and each data set independently. Uh, we compared uh, our results based on uh, F1 scores. So uh, you see that we had different uh, distributions for each of the data sets. So uh, for example, in this specific task, uh, each data set performed the best on its own. And uh, this is the toxicity type uh, task. And here it's also a multi-label data set. This is why uh, you see that the counts are very different. We had more multi-label data in English. And here, actually, the multitask, multitask learning and multilingual settings helped a bit in, in, uh, in terms of macro F1. Uh, for the target attribute here, uh, multitask learning helped, but, but each data set performed uh, the best on its own. So this is uh, multi-class, but it's single labeled. For the annotator sentiment, this was uh, a task where we had very low, very low agreement, which actually makes sense. And we can talk about that later if you would like to. And we had much more multi-labeled uh, instances in English. And here, actually also, overall, actually each data set and performed the best on its own. For uh, the target group, this is not a multi-label task, but it's highly imbalanced. I mean, hate speech data sets are inherently imbalanced, but this is highly imbalanced because of the fact that we had 16 classes. And here, actually, logistic regression performed better than all the other um, uh, paradigms. So uh, quick reality check. Uh, I thought that we could reach a unified representation that takes nuances into account. Now, the answer is somewhat, somehow yes, in the sense that uh, maybe it's better than uh, saying this is hate, this is non-hate. And also think about it this way, when you have a fine-grained uh, annotation scheme, then you can turn it into uh, coarse-grained, but not the reverse. But, uh, but, but actually, the disagreement is high. Now, I thought that transfer and multitask learning could improve the detection. The answer is not really. And actually, additional experiments, including data augmentation using, using machine translation, did not help. And uh, further work by other people, uh, at least two years ago, showed that actually transfer learning doesn't necessarily ha help in, this, uh, in these settings. It's a very hard problem. It's a highly subjective task, so it makes sense. So uh, one of the questions that you may ask is why didn't the multilingual settings boost the performance that much? And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons, is the fact that we have cultural and cross-lingual differences. So I looked into the cross-lingual, uh, the cultural differences, and to give you an idea about why we should look at this, that it's because languages evolve and linguistic nuances are highly culturally dependent. Uh, they depend on the socio-cultural background of anybody, basically. And we have a huge lack of context in the data. And social structures are language and culture dependent. And uh, sometimes even within one language. So, for example, uh, language English spoken in the UK is different from English spoken in the US. And even like within some regions in the US, they are different. So the social um, dynamics are different. So uh, when you look at topic models, when you generate topic models on different uh, data sets, which I did basically uh, on 17, on uh, seven, seven, in seven languages in total, then actually you have these uh, common uh, topics that are recurring. Now you may think that this is due to the fact that usually we are interested in some keywords and then we collect data uh, based on these keywords or based on these topics, and then they come back. But also, the f there is also um, there is also cultural there are also cultural specificities. 
to take into account. So um, topics that are spoken about in Arabic are different from the ones spoken about in Indonesian or in Portuguese, for example. Uh, and uh, if you look at these highlighted words um, in red here in English, French, German, and Italian and Portuguese, then it's the topic in, of immigration and refugees. And while actually in Arabic and Indonesian, uh, this is not, these are not the main topics that you find. So you find uh, sectarian hate speech or um, uh, political uh, content and so on and so forth. And even this, uh, the slurs are different, the insults are different. So if these, if you come back to these recurrent topic, uh, one would ask, uh, could this be due to the same collection strategy based on keywords? And uh, let's examine in this case, selection bias. So uh, I examined selection bias uh, through evaluation in a language and a label agnostic way. So what's usually, how, how do we usually uh, approach the problem of toxic content detection if, if you look at a general pipeline? So usually you select keywords, hashtags and accounts that you may be interested in. You collect data, then you annotate it, then you train a classifier and then you classify your data. Uh, so bias can happen at any stage of this pipeline. So it can be within the embeddings or the language model that you're using or whatever. It can be uh, due to the collection process, which is selection bias. It's can, it can be over amplified by the model due to the fit, to the fit function itself. And it can be uh, due to the annotation process and it uh, shows in a label bias. So uh, we chose to actually look at uh, selection bias and uh, what do you observe usually, again, uh, getting back to uh, what I talked to you about in the beginning, about how current toxicity filters work, then uh, actually, if you have identity words or some, say the N-word, for example, some slurs, uh, due to the lack of context due, and due to the data that, you're, that, that you trained your um, classifier on, your classifier may give you uh, a, a false result. Basically, for example, it may label data as hateful when it's not hateful due to this bias that you have and that may happen at any stage of the pipeline. So it can be just because it saw the word women, while actually the noun or the adjective here can be positive, or just because it saw the, the N-word. So uh, there, there's a lot of work on, on this, but I'll be talking about selection bias. Why? Because uh, when we looked back then, uh, three years ago, at the data and uh, at, the, at work on bias, there was a big focus on the annotation process and uh, the classifier itself, the performance itself. While we thought that the collection process may be a bit overlooked. So that's why we focused on the collection process. And uh, the selection bias can happen due to the fact that we go with the same collection strategy across languages, and we actually have highly imbalanced data, but uh, this is also another problem that uh, shows later. But we, we, we do this, like we have, this, we have the same collection strategy across data sets. And we have different, even if we are interested in different annotation schemes. And uh, when we are going with this same collection strategy based on keywords or uh, identity words or whatever, this creates a bias because you have many instances, you have a highly imbalanced data set that you have many instances. And you can see that actually in the perspective API, if you wanna, if you wanna test it, you have many instances that had like certain words. So they end up, whenever your classifier sees them, it classifies them as hateful. And actually I was talking to somebody who works in criminology and cybersecurity, and they told me that this also happens to detection of crimes in the sense that, for example, they, uh, if you have a post with let XYZ in, then it would tell you that, oh, there's like a high risk of, of this post being a criminal one, while 
it's not it's just because uh, it's so latin and latin may indicate somebody uh, wanting to steal something or someone or something so we uh went uh, we we went with evaluating uh, selection bias in a label and a language agnostic way by running topic models and ben and then by comparing the generated topics with initial keywords that were used during the collection process based on the semantic similarity measure now your semantic similarity measure can be any uh, semantic similarity measure that you would like to go with it can be based on word embeddings it can be based on your own word uh, your own embeddings it can be based on uh, word associations such as wordnet and we looked at them on average via first met metric that we called b1 uh, and the second metric uh, by looking at the maximal similarity between uh, topic words and um, and uh, and keywords that were used during the collection process so for the keywords to give you an idea, we actually collected them either by looking at the GitHub repository of the data sets that, we're, that we were uh, investing or uh, by looking at the resource papers. So uh, B1 gives you the, an idea about the average stability of uh, the topics and B2 gives you an idea about how regularly the keywords appear in your, uh, in your data. So uh, B1 gives you an idea about the relatedness of the keywords uh, in each topic and then uh, in each topic with each topic word and then with each topic. It's like it's an average of an average. And uh, B2 tells you how, whether each topic word is similar or identical to an, uh, a keyword. I won't uh, present all the experiments that we uh, went with. Uh, but we actually had experiments with uh, based on embeddings, fast text embeddings, and also our own uh, trained embeddings, and also based on WordNet. Now, uh, if you look at these keywords that were reported in the uh, data sets, in the data, the data set papers, then the highlighted red one appear also in generated topics. Uh, which means that they appear a lot in a data set. So this is problematic. Now we run experiments to measure the bias in different data sets in different languages. So you can see here that we run them on seven diff different languages uh, on uh, and and in these data sets, like the number of uh, the collected tweets uh, differed, so it could be as small as more than four four hundred instances, or or more than uh, tens of thousands of tweets. Uh, the number of keywords that were used during the collection process differed from five to more than a hundred, and also the average length of tweet also differed. Now, the idea about why you should use evaluation or I mean, I would like you to use evaluation, is that, for example, if you would like to do transfer learning, for example, and then you have, for example, two data sets and you would like to balance your data, which is inherently imbalanced, then uh, maybe you should think about having a less biased data set towards keywords related to gender, for example, combining it with another data set that has uh, more bias towards a certain ethnicity, for example, and then you combine them and you kind of balance your data or you could include it in your collection process. And this was the idea. And uh, we actually run experiments on different data sets, as you see, as you see here, depending on different numbers of words generated in topics and also different numbers of topics. Now, the reported metrics were stable across data set and they showed also low, low correlation scores between metrics and summary statistics. And uh, we had actually shown empirically that there were recurring topics in different data sets and that we could use these metrics to uh, revise the collection process or to actually think about how to combine the different data sets to kind of mitigate the uh, problem of bias. So the lessons learned from this first part is that there's no unified representation of toxic language for good reasons. There is no unanimous definition of hate speech versus toxic uh, and abusive language. And annotating data given a lack of context is hard. There are cultural differences to be taken into account, including within one language only. And we need to set constraints before normalizing an, uh, uh, an annotation scheme. These cultural differences and selection bias ought to be addressed early on, actually, 
at the collection process. So uh, in some of the ongoing work with a really nice team of people working on the Afri AIDS project, I'm trying also to avoid by mistake. So uh, during the collection process, we're having regular checkpoints, we're having bias measurement. Uh, I mean, eventually we'll have that. At, uh, for now, we didn't uh, we didn't reach that level. And we know the annotators. We're avoiding Amazon Mechanical Turk because when you know the annotators are also a really nice work by other people on uh, how actually bias appears at the instructions uh, and not only later in the pipeline and also not only because of your annotators. Maybe you did something wrong during uh, your uh, definition of the instructions. So we're kind of communicating more with the, with the annotators and we're trying to avoid demographic bias. Uh, so also annotators can quit at any time because this is absolutely not fun data to deal with. Uh, even the, the examples that I showed you here are not the most shocking examples. So we're having also regular checkpoints and we're revising our guidelines based on their feedback as well. I'm going to talk about automated fact checking in NLP as a use case. I think I have enough time. So uh, it, here, I was more aware of the needs in automated fact checking. So experts do want automation uh, to save time because there's a huge amount of information uh, that needs to be processed. And also they sometimes need hours to actually a, a day to actually verify claims and write fact-checking articles. But what they, what they do not want is a veracity prediction classifier, something that tells them this claim is true or it's false, because this is not going to help them uh, with their mission or their work. So they want help, for example, with evidence retrieval. So for example, uh, they would like uh, tools that would help them uh, retrieve the evidence uh, more quickly or retrieve the right evidence. They would like actually explainable tools in machine learning, and they would like help with claim detection. So uh, we presented this work at MNLP 2022 with Moy and, Don and Andreas, and uh, the idea is that we see fact-checking as question generation followed by question answering. Now, the, different, the, dif the difference here is that um, usually in question answering, you have the answers ready. While in fact checking, the answers are what you're looking for. So fact checking can be expressed as question generation followed by question answering as evidence retrieval. And actually, uh, previous work by Fanetol 2020 showed that this actually reduces time spent on verification but by almost 20%. So for example, for this claim, we balanced the budget act, uh, the budget with the 1997 balanced budget act and ultimately had four, con uh, four consecutive balanced budgets. Then uh, you could generate questions about who's responsible for the 1997 bu balanced budget act or what's the 1997 balanced budget act. And then you can use a search engine to retrieve evidence and to give you the answers of these questions. And then you can write your fact checking article. You can um, investigate whether this claim is true or false and so on and so forth. So uh, current question generation systems assume that the answer is given as input, while actually the answer is what is being sought in fact checking. And that's why we actually tried to use what we called focal points as guidance when generating uh, questions, because we do not have any answers as input. We only have the claim and possibly the metadata. By metadata, I mean the source or the speaker of the claim and um, the uh, date of the claim, if you have it. Now, uh, by uh, what we do is that given this claim, uh, we, ex we parse the claim we do syntactic parsing you can use any other parsing it's better than having a random uh, random spans in the claim so it's kind of like a rule based call it a rule based if you would like to uh, uh, guidance of the of the uh, of the generation and then we generated questions for each focal points and then we ranked the generated questions so for example here focal points could be for example we as, as like a leaf of your syntactic uh, tree, or they could be like a bigger, uh, a bigger, a bigger chunk, a bigger span in the claim. Uh, 
because it's part of another subtree. So, for example, it can be the 1997 Balanced Budget Act, which we, these these are two example focal points that I have been uh, highlighting here. So uh, then you can uh, use these focal points to guide the generation, and then you generate your questions. So, for example, here you can have. Uh, what's the balance? What's the 1997 Balanced Budget Act, or who's responsible for the 1997 Balanced Budget Act? And then uh, we use actually uh, we use these uh, pairs of question focal points to train our question generation system, and we use a cosine similarity function to greedily match focal points with gold answers because we used a data set that had gold questions and gold answers in our uh, training. So for re-ranking, we had uh, we trained the regression model. Uh, so given a claim and its generated questions, we, our re-ranker decides the best uh, questions based on the similarity of each generated question with the gold questions that we had in our training data. So for example, here uh, we generated twenty questions. So our re-ranker removed the duplicates. And then it output the top n questions. For example, here the n is equal to four, so it ranked them. Uh, and then we run experiments using the QA briefs dataset by Fanny et al. 2020. It has more than 7,000 claims from news data, and they are fact checking articles. It was the only one uh, that was appropriate for our task. There's a new one that was released by my colleagues actually two days ago, uh, and I'd be happy to actually uh, test it. And um, it has uh, more than 21,000 questions ranked by crowd workers. And we reserved actually a small uh, data set for, to train the re-ranker. So we didn't use the data to, the, to train our re-rank, the data that we used for question generation uh, to actually train our re-ranker. So in our, we had different baselines and uh, we, in our pre-processing, we extracted the focal points using spacey for syntactic parsing, and uh, we had a squad baseline, basically just like a really uh, a, 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 a model that was uh, that was trained on squad, and we had a BART model. We had a BART model that we first generated questions uh, starting with um, uh, with typical question words such as how, why, who, that's what we call WH part. We had our very focal model, which was pre-trained on squad and fine-tuned on the QA brief data set. And we had very focal plus meta, and here we actually used metadata. So if available, of course, uh, the, the source of the claim and the uh, date of the claim, if available. So uh, overall, actually our models outperformed other systems. So here TER is an error rate. So the lower, the better, by the way. So it it, it has a low error rate compared to other systems, and also it has uh, better blue scores, meteor, rouge scores, and so on and so forth. And for human evaluation, we had three annotators annotating 250 questions, automatically generated questions. We actually generated sets of questions per, per claim, so that was also a challenge. And uh, they had to, but they had to evaluate individual questions based on their intelligibility. So if it's uh, it doesn't have to be to, so a question doesn't have to be 100% grammatical. It just needs to be understandable. Uh, they had to judge the clarity. So it's like, is it Googleable if I edit it a bit? And um, relevance. So if it doesn't hallucinate uh, entities that are not in the claim and the metadata, and they had also to judge the informativeness of the claim. And this is the hardest criterion because uh, this is how we try to define what's a good fact-checking question. So whether it will add more information or not. So it, so it the the question can be uninformative, actually useless, weakly informative, meaning that I do not really mind my system to generate this question, but it's not a great question. Potentially informative, meaning that it may be a good question, but I need more context, I need more information to judge whether it is whether it is a good question or not. Or informative or crucial for fact checking. So overall, our uh, system performed uh, the best in all the, the, the criteria, but I'm showing you the informativeness criteria only because it's the hardest one. So here, brighter means better and the very focal models 
uh, had more generated more informative uh, questions according to our uh, human evaluation. So we had an additional analysis. You can check our EMNLP paper where we showed that it improves the quality of questions and this can help with evidence retrieval. And when we looked at subsets of focal points, uh, we showed that we could use subsets of focal points instead of all the focal points without relying necessarily on named entities. And this is very important in fact checking because many of the heuristics that are used out there rely on named entities. And it shows that you can actually, instead of using named entities, you can go with, with uh, uh, syntactic parse trees or uh, spans uh, based on the syntactic parses. And we showed also that very focal performs fairly well on clar clarification question generation uh, without taking additional questions as input, which is a good thing actually. So I'm going to uh, give you the final takeaway. Uh, it's important to actually, if, if you think again about any model that you're building, you need to think about it as a non-detached from the users and from people who are generating data uh, that you're building your model on. So any models means, mean and what you're building actually, needs to be aligned with the ends or the goals or the goals that you're trying to reach. So they, they need to be consistent in order, your means and ends need to be consistent in order uh, to, to, to actually uh, have reach your goals in terms of modeling and in terms of impact. So some of the future directions that I'm working on is better bias evaluation metrics for toxic language data sets, uh, hate speech detection models better aligned with moderators needs as well. Uh, so this is also going to be built on when I was not very much aware of what was being done. Uh, so again, it was not very useless. And uh, I'm working also on higher quality data set uh, collection and better fact checking, uh, re-ranking, fact checking, question generation, re-ranking. So, uh, so I'm, I'm working on the re-ranking part. So I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators, my uh, awesome colleagues at the Cambridge NLP group, uh, especially Andreas, uh, Moy and Mikhail. Uh, other colleagues that work with me on uh, data, on data collection for African languages, uh, especially Maryam Shamsuddin, uh, Saif, and others who who are who are doing uh, fantastic work uh, for African languages, and thanks also to our annotators who annotated the data. And with this, I reach the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for uh, your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Hello. Hello, yes. Hi, good question. Um, so sure. if I got it correctly, a lot of what you look at is in the content of, of the tweets. Have you tried also looking at networks? So like if you think um, someone, you have a tweet that might be hateful, looking mm -hmm. at the other people that they're connected to, whether they, they, um, they tweet at and seeing if, well, maybe it's not, maybe it is, but then they follow a lot of people or they interact with a lot of people who mm -hmm. do post hateful content. Alternatively, have you also looked at spread of hate speech? So mm -hmm. it might originate somewhere and then people that follow them suddenly start speaking like them. So that, sort of like a graph neural network mm -hmm. analysis. Got it. Uh, so I did not, but there is work in the area. I'm happy to share it. Uh, but uh, actually there is um, there's work that looks at how uh, people who share hateful content are connected mm -hmm. and how basically... so. I think I, I didn't mention that, but basically, I mean, we're all on social media and we can say that basically the norm is not hate, hate speech, mm -hmm. but hate speech does get a lot of attention, right? Mm -hmm. So there's really fantastic work by, I think, Matthew et al. from IIT Karakpur, who, who did like a lot of work on the spread of hate speech and also on uh, the on on how uh, how the users are connected. I did not, but okay. I do recommend uh, looking at, at their work. Yeah. Okay, well, sorry, what was that name? Uh, Matthew, uh, Binny Matthew. Uh, let me write that in the chat. Okay, thanks. thanks. You're welcome. Is there any, just wanna... 
Thank you uh, for the comment about question generation followed by question answering. This was not actually my initial idea. This was uh, a way of uh, the, the, the whole question generation followed by question answering is uh, the idea of my advisor, uh, Andreas. Uh, Vlachos, and we we I I also agree that it's a clever idea. So uh, we're working on different variations of that, and I think it's it's really cool. And there's so much to do in the area. Actually, there's so much to do with improving the questions, improving the answers, and also maybe if you do like question answering, you may think that yeah, this is kind of an easy task. It's not actually. It's very hard, and uh, the hardest part is the answer retrieval. Uh, I do agree that it's actually really a clever idea because uh, a few days ago I was working on an application. It was more of a product, uh -huh. and where we were using uh, a, a GPT-based GPT-3 model to mm -hmm. actually extract questions from the given facts. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I initially thought it would work very well, but uh, that prompt was not very well crafted. So. Mm -hmm. It took me a while to get to yes. a specific prompt that can generate good questions, but still it was not very accurate. Yeah. But I think it improved our results with a quite good margin. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, also like the whole uh, thinking about uh, what's a good fact checking question is already like a research area on its own. Like it's very hard to define what's a good fact checking question. Like that's why we can kind of come up with the idea of informativeness, but of course, like there's so much to think about uh, when it comes to that and even in other areas i'm not just talking i'm just giving you fact checking as an example because it's a hard task actually but uh even in other areas like what's a good question for this specific task what is uh, what should you do and uh, what should you do and so on and so forth i think i have an idea since you've been talking about uh this uh, specific case I think there is a nice uh, paper that came out, I think two days ago or so, uh, about uh, using uh, logical rules for for uh, for factuality and uh, and question generation. If I remember well, if I find it, I will definitely send it to you. Uh, I think you were also uh, writing the name of someone in chat. <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So for so the awesome. name, uh, it's been me. Uh, for the work, uh, I, I really recommend the work uh, of, and actually the whole group are doing really good work on that. I really like their work. They are also the ones who who did uh, who did some work on um, on on fair speech recently, rather than hate speech, because like again like the the over generalization is so problematic that we end up with very different definitions very different um uh very different data sets as well and so on and so forth so i think there's a lot to do and uh, the the first step would be to basically have the right definitions and have the have all that and uh, also talk to whoever we would like to help yes it is yes they are uh and not only that like even even the topic themselves it's it's very uh it's they these are very different like from a language to another and sometimes even from within one language like even variations of say Arabic. That's why I, I kind of work on right now, I'm just working on Algerian Arabic rather than Arabic in general, because um, the culture in different parts of the Arab, Arabic speaking world are different. This does not mean that there aren't any common things between any common attributes between different countries, but but the the language is different the social dynamics are different this is very that's why it's very important uh, not to think only about the model that we are training or the data that we are collecting but also about these really like uh, details or what seems to be details and integrate them when when you're when you're working on such sens sensitive tasks uh, i think we have no more questions okay uh, thank, thank you, you very so much for having me I really Thank enjoyed you. this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks Thank for the nice comments and questions.
and uh, hopefully uh, we can talk about any uh, if you have any comment about any topic or anything i'm i'm happy to talk about them i remember that we talked about think language models also if you're interested also in hyper bias in language models and public language then you can send that over email or whatever yeah definitely okay cool thank you very much and uh, have a good rest of your day thank you for staying until now yeah. thank you very much thank you bye yeah. bye